This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Mark Magnuson. Hello and welcome into Ag Matters PM on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Mark Magnuson. Today is Friday, June 30th, 2023, and we're so glad you could join us for today's show. In today's episode, I will speak with Dusty Odekoven. He is the Chief Veterinarian for the National Pork Board. Had a chance to catch up with Dusty yesterday at Iowa Swine Day at Iowa State University. I will also have a check of the ag weather outlook, but first, let's run down the markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. At the end of another trading day, we are joined by Jacob Burks of agmarket.net. We are heading into the 4th of July weekend, but we had two reports that we received from the USDA today. And Jacob, I think coming into Friday today, we didn't expect some big surprises, but it turns out that we did get some surprises. What did we learn in the reports today? Uh, we learned that the USDA, uh, you know, realized either A, that we uh, used more corn and beans and wheat than we thought we were uh, using throughout the quarter, or B, uh, you know, maybe the yields, maybe the, maybe, the, maybe the products just weren't there in the, in the beginning. So that's kind of the question mark. It doesn't really matter uh, how the math happened, but the quarterly stocks report came in uh, well below, uh, not well, well below the average estimates uh, within the range, but barely at the bottom side of the range in both corn, beans, and wheat. Uh, looking at corn at 4.1 you know billion bushels looking at uh, the the beans uh, right under uh, 800 million million bushels left on hand so uh, that was that was that kind of propped the the beans up it actually propped the corn up a little bit in the old crop uh, we actually went positive there for a little bit uh it's actually a really weird deal with the, when the market was when the report was supposed to be released it didn't come out exactly and then the market kind of went up a little bit in the corn and beans immediately reacted because the beans they cut in Four million acres out uh, from last from the previous uh, estimate. So from the, the March and planning intentions report, we took four million acres out of the soybeans, and that was a really big shock to that marketplace. And Jacob, you're right. That's just a big number, the four million number. I think sometimes those adjustments, one two million, okay, that's one thing, but this is a it's a significant number. Right. I mean, it's it's so many years past that we've talked about. Oh, it was really wet in this part of the country, and. Uh, we don't know, you know, we don't, we don't think that they got planted here. And so there's acres, you know, where did the acres go to? How many uh, prevent plant acres are we going to have? All those discussions every year between March to, to, to the June report is something that you, you just can anticipate. This year, there wasn't a whole lot of that. It was dry. Uh, the, the, you had a little bit of a problem maybe in the northern part of the grain belt, but that talk wasn't happening. You didn't, you know, Ag Twitter was boring with acres. I mean, if we hadn't had weather to talk about, I don't know what Twitter would have done. But it was, you know, we were we were watching the, uh, uh, you know, the planning pace, you know, go very very quickly, and I think that's a testament to what we hear a lot that when farmers start planting corn, they keep planting corn. Uh, you know, input costs were coming down uh, as they were planting corn, so that they were allowed to, you know, maybe get some cheaper fertilizer, maybe they went ahead and planted that extra field. So uh, that's, you know, that's that's what the market told us here today that we planted, uh, you know, two million acres more of corn, uh, four million acres less of beans. And there was some other commodity, you know, so the sorghum looked like they took up some of the of, of the rain of the of the extra acres. Uh, there was a few other, you know, spring wheat took up some of the more of those acres that were there. So uh, all in all, uh, you know, very friendly report for the beans, uh, very negative for the corn. Well, Jacob, don't worry, we won't let you get away without talking about weather. So we'll do it right now. We had a storm roll through parts of the Corn Belt last night, brought some actually some damaging winds here to the state of Iowa and east of Iowa in a, an actual derecho event. But we are talking earlier this week, we'd mentioned that the weather models were turning wetter. At least right now, it does seem like that is it starting to show itself a little bit. Uh, yeah, it feels it feels that way. I mean, you can uh, you know we we talked to Eric a little bit. We talked to a lot of different uh, see you see information from all over the port. You know the the weather spectrum there. Uh, you know one of the problems that we have is the information is too readily available sometimes to everybody, and everybody becomes a weatherman. And so you know you get reports that yeah the you know, the, the models are starting to change. They're starting to have more you know moisture in the atmosphere, all that kind of stuff. They've been calling for this event across the the, the Midwest. With the with the rains that we saw last night, but uh, you know, uh, I think Eric uh, Eric Snodgrass quoted it, you know, on Twitter. He said, you know, 
droughts don't break easy. And so that's something that we looked at came a lot of storms. And I think that was uh, damage yet to be a, te a test. I, I, I called around a little bit, you know, people that I thought were in that areas, you know, the people I talked to without just looking on the pictures on the social media and stuff, I uh, didn't really feel like the, the, the grant, uh, their crops were damaged at all. They had some trees, had some stuff, but uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's a hard thing to assess. If you remember when 2020, we didn't really know how bad it was till a little bit later. So, uh, uh, you know, this this came early, so maybe we can have if the crops that are damaged now. Maybe we can see them recover. But models are starting to change. Weather starting, you know, it's, it, there's a potential to get you know, more rain, I guess, all through the next couple of weeks. So that could be very, very uh, pivotal coming into the pollination period. So, Jacob, we had all the fireworks today on the grain side of the markets. How did the livestock markets react? Uh, it was it was a very eventful day in the livestock markets, too. As soon as the report came out, the, the feeder cattle really liked the, the fact that corn was down 10 to 15 here pretty early and then ended up closing 30 lower. Uh, so the, the feeder cattle ended up closing today $55.20 uh, higher uh, in, in, the, in the feeder cattle. We're making new contract highs uh, in feeder cattle here this week. I think the October traded up today 253.22 on the high. That was November to, to, to 253.22. So an outstanding uh, move, outstanding trade in the, in the, in the livestock. I'll be honest with you. I didn't even look to see what cash uh, <laughs> cattle did or what we what we even did to today in the the box beef. Uh, it was just such a busy day, and the grain market caught everybody's attention. But you know, live cattle did react positively. We're two sixty seven higher in the the October or the August fats. You know, that's trading at one seventy seven. June still back above one eighty one here. So this is just a good solid move, and the cattle continue to stay strong. Uh, looking at the the hog market. We've seen a little bit of negativity coming off of that hogs and pigs report yesterday. I thought it could have even been more uh, negative, but the back months held in there. We're only a dollar lower in October. So I consider that a good trade today in hogs. Jacob, how can our viewers get in touch with you and the rest of the team at agmarket.net for more for more marketing information? Uh, we're going to be, uh, look, just look us up here at agmarket.net. Uh, do a 30-day free trial of our of our intel. Uh, we'd love to chat with you here directly. You can call 608-384-5438. A busy day for everybody today. We thank you, Jacob, for taking some time to join us. Have a great break. Have a great weekend and a great 4th of July. Absolutely. Happy Independence Day. That was Jacob Burks with agmarket.net. Let's turn our attention now to the closing numbers, courtesy of the folks at Bar Chart. July corn down 26 and a half at 554 and a half. New crop December corn down 33 and three quarters at 494 and three quarters. July soybeans up 74 and a quarter at 1557 and a quarter. New crop November soybeans up 77 and a half at 13.43 and a quarter. August soybean meal up 17 even at 4.13.90. August soybean oil up four even at 61.70. Chicago wheat down 16 and a half at 6.51 even. Minneapolis wheat down eight and a half at 8.17 even. Kansas City hard red wheat unchanged at eight dollars even. September oats up six even at 3.89 and a half. On the Merck, August live cattle up $2.67 at $177.17. August feeder cattle up $5.20 at $247.57. July lean hogs up $0.20 cents at $95.65. July pork cutout up $0.27 cents at $101.07. Class 3 milk down a cent at $14.91. And that's been a check of the Ag Market Recap here on Ag Matters PM. It's time now to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. And when we come back... I will be joined by Dusty Odakoven of the National Pork Board. This is AMPM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Mark Magnuson. Today, I speak with Dusty Odakoven. He is the chief veterinarian with the National Pork Board. And Dusty and I spoke yesterday at Iowa Swine Day at Iowa State University. Mark Magnuson for the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. And I'm here with Dusty Odakoven. He is the chief veterinarian with the National Pork Board. And Dusty here today. Of course, we are at Sw Iowa Swine Day at Iowa State University. And as we've been talking about a lot, of course, foreign animal disease prevention, and that was what your presentation was on today. And specifically, you've gotten to see that up close and personal, how they're dealing with it in Europe. What lessons have you learned from that trip and just studying this disease in general and how it can be applied to our country? 
Yeah, Mark, had a, I had a great opportunity last November to uh, accompany a group of producers and veterinarians, state and animal health officials, uh, to uh, go to see some of the company, countries in Europe that have dealt with African swine fever virus and learn from them what were their successes and what were their challenges uh, to try to give us a little better understanding of what could we be doing more of or what could, could we be doing better. So, And, and we really saw a, a wide uh, variety of things. We, we learned from Denmark the importance of keeping the virus out. Denmark made the decision to actually construct a fence between the border with Denmark and Germany, which is only 40 miles, but they, they constructed a very sturdy fence to keep wild boar out, wild boar, the, the reservoir of disease. And then uh, they, they have very strict tr uh, wash, truck washing requirements for trucks entering the country. Belgium uh, gave us a, an understanding of how to eradicate uh, the disease. They found it in, in wild boar and were able to contain the population of wild boar, eliminate them. And two years after they found the initial finding, they, they regained their free status as a country, so uh, a success there. Uh, Poland uh, actually continues to trade pork uh, and to export pork even to the United States, even while they have African swine fever virus in both uh, domestic and wild swine. Uh, but through a series of regionalization, they're able to source pork from free areas and, and continue to demonstrate that and have some continuity of business. Uh, Romania has endemic uh, ASF and, and really no exportability, and their population is, or their swine population is in decline. And then Germany, uh, because of the interface with Poland, had uh, wild boar populations that came over, infected their population, and then subsequently had uh, disease in domestic swine that were a long ways from uh, where the wild boar population are through the movement of infected or contaminated products by people. So, uh, so, we, so we learned a lot about the risks of people, uh, wild boar, the importance of fencing, and the importance of regionalization. So Dusty, how does that feral pig population and what you learned about how they're using it or trying to contain that within their pigs, the feral pigs, and keeping it from transferring to domestic production, how does that apply to us? Because our feral pig population, not as intertwined with the society as it is in Europe. Right, yeah, and especially here in, in the Midwest, we don't really see a lot of uh, feral swine activity, but we do in the United States, in the United States have over six million uh, feral swine, which would be similar to the wild boar population that they have in Europe. The difference being that the wild boar are throughout Europe, and, and ours are really kind of more located in the southeast. But uh, if you get down into Texas and Oklahoma or any of those uh, in, in kind of further to the east of there, you'll see a lot of uh, activity due to of feral swine, they're destructive to uh, property and fences and uh, really tear things up. In addition, they carry diseases here in the United States that are uh, you know, we've eradicated from the domestic population, such as brucellosis and pseudorabies virus. But uh, the, 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 the answer to your question, though, is that if we were to get African swine fever virus in our wild boar, in our feral swine population, it could impact our ability to trade uh, domestic pork and pork products. And that's, a, that's 28 to 30 percent of our production here in the United States. And that would be because foreign countries would say this United States supply has been affected, so we're going to look somewhere else. Yeah, that's correct. And so taking quick action to control the disease in, in feral swine would be, would be incredibly important. And that, those are some of the lessons that we took home from our European trip. So Dusty, you go on those trips with um, industry executives and people that are helping to make the decisions to hopefully fight this disease. Um, then you come back to the United States, you come to events like this, Iowa Swine Day or World Pork Expo. Are you happy with the response you see from people, you know, really investing in trying to get ahead of this and make sure that they're prepared and not trying to respond to something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think really since 2018, when African swine, African swine fever virus got into China and it spread to 32 provinces in China and then really throughout Asia, uh, there was really a, an increased awareness of the impact of that disease and the potential for it to come here. So really since 2018, 2019, uh, National Pork Board, for example, has been very focused on foreign animal disease uh, prevention, specifically African swine fever virus. What can we do to, uh, to increase our ability to detect the virus? What can we do to increase the preparedness of our farms to, to both keep it out and also to be prepared for continuity of business should we have an incursion here? So a lot of work has been done. We've got uh, the Secure Pork Supply Plan uh, that you can read about at securepork.org. We've got AgView, which is a pig movement uh, tracing database that's, uh, that is free for uh, producers to use. They can put their 
pig movement data in there and the state animal health official can have access to it in the, in the event that they need it. Uh, and then we've got the certified swine sample collector training program which trains non-veterinarians to be able to collect samples under the direction of their accredited veterinarian. So those are just some of the examples of work that's been ongoing and as I talk to people, uh, you know, as you mentioned at, at different uh, different venues, uh, there is a lot of interest in, in, in being prepared and, and using some of these tools. But a lot more work is left to be done and we really need people to uh, engage more fully in, in these preparedness activities. So to that point, Dusty, just to wrap up, what would you like to let our viewers, our listeners here in the state of Iowa know about when it comes to just being prepared for foreign animal disease? Yeah, one of the, one of the best resources you can go to is uh, porkcheckoff.org. Porkcheckoff.org has links to our uh, foreign animal disease preparedness checklist with resources, resources such as the Secure Pork Supply Plan, AgView, and the Certified Swine Sample Collector Training Program. The other thing I would encourage people to do is to enroll in the U.S. Swine Health Improvement Plan, uh, which aims to have a monitoring program for African swine fever virus. Dusty Yodokovin, our guest. He is the Chief Veterinarian with the NPB. Dusty, thank you so much for your time at Iowa Swine Day. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. And that was the Chief Veterinarian of the National Pork Board, Dusty Odekoven. Let's turn our attention now to the Ag Weather Outlook. A storm with damaging winds made its way through the state of Iowa last night, especially on the far eastern portion of the state. That moved east of Iowa and did turn into a derecho as those damaging winds continued. Here in the state today, we've had scattered thunderstorms, rain shower activity. We did receive quite a decent rain here in central Iowa to begin the day, and those wet conditions will continue into the evening with those chances for showers and thunderstorms. And then again tomorrow on Saturday, we are looking at widespread thunderstorm activity. So let's turn our attention now to the National Weather Service and what's in store for the next 24 hours. As you can see from the National Weather Service, scattered thunderstorm chances statewide today with high temperatures expected 80 to 89. Tonight, partly cloudy, showers and scattered thunderstorm chances in our low temperature range 63 to 68. For tomorrow, showers and thunderstorms likely on Saturday, high temperatures expected in a 79 to 83 range. And taking a look now at our affiliate weather map for tomorrow, Cherokee, expected high of 82 with a slight chance for thunderstorms. Shenandoah, showers likely, then thunderstorms, and a high around 79. For Des Moines on Saturday, 81 the expected high, thunderstorms likely. Albia, thunderstorms likely as well with a high around 81. In Waterloo on Saturday, chance for thunderstorms, then thunderstorms likely, high around 83. Clinton, a chance for thunderstorms, then thunderstorms likely, and a high around 82. For a more detailed forecast in your part of the state, make sure and check with your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate. And that's been a check of the Ag Weather Outlook. That also brings us to the end of this episode of Ag Matters PM. You can find all of our content on our website at iowaagnet.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. And you can find our video content on our YouTube page, at Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. And don't forget our free twice daily market podcasts, which are on Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and Podbean. From the IARN studios in Des Moines, I'm Mark Magnuson. For Riley Smith and Dustin Huffman, we thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.